okay. In today's video, I wanted to create something for new players. Those of us who are just jumping into Age of Sigmar lore for the first time trying to kind of get their bearings on the lore in the universe and get caught up with the story thus far. Now I'm going to start off by saying there is way too much information to condense into a single video, so I'll be referencing my playlist where I fully explore these things in a lot of detail. All the resources you need based on this video are down in the show notes below. This is a deep rabbit hole, you can get lost in it, I have over 200 videos most of which are dedicated to Age of Sigmar lore for various factions and kind of are a grand plot events and stuff like that. Age of Sigmar is a fantastic game set in the extreme fantasy scape of the mortal realms. This is a, a catch-all term for eight different settings, each themed around a particular kind of magic. I did a video exploring the nature of the realms, which you can watch down below. And this setting is the backdrop for an incredible series that begins with a prehistory period called the Age of Myth, where the gods walked freely with mortals. Small tribes of human and elves and dwarven were nurtured and they grew into these huge sprawling empires and there was technological progress and peace and enlightenment. And many of the stories surrounding this time are kind of shrouded in mystery. Games Workshop gives us little bits right here and there about kind of things that happen, mostly the drama amongst the gods that happen in the Age of Myth. And some of them are actual events like discussions that Teclis had with Sigmar, which are just two characters, two of the gods. Um, and the others are kind of these grandiose folklorish myths about how the realms came to be. So it's kind of this weird, again, it's called the Age of Myth. It's this period that we know little about and we're getting little breadcrumbs of information, but you always have to wonder if it's real or not. And basically it just kind of forms this period of time where things are just great. Progress is happening, technological advancements are happening at an incredible rate, and things are good. But as you may have noticed, this game is not called Peace Hammer Age of Sigmar, it is called Warhammer Age of Sigmar, because far away from the mortal realms, there is a place called the Realm of Chaos. And within the Realm of Chaos, the four great chaos gods stirred, envious of the mortal realms, wanting to kill, conquer, infect, and twist the realms to their own sick vision. You see, these four chaos gods have something called the Great Game. And uh, basically the, the game is who amongst the four chaos gods can be the greatest and the best. And so to achieve that, they're going to conquer everything they can, including the mortal realms. And with that, chaos broke upon the mortal realms themselves. Demonic hordes unleashed to an unprepared world. And at the same time, the pantheon of gods who lived amongst the mortal realms fought to defend them, led by one in particular, the god king Sigmar, who is god of Azir, the realm of heavens. The combined power of this pantheon generally held back the tide of chaos. That was until Nagash, the god of undeath, from the realm of death, Shaiish, saw an opportunity. You see, he didn't really like taking orders from Sigmar. They were an ally of convenience at best. And so he hatched a little bit of a plan. He was going to let the rest of the pantheon of gods, all defending the realms, fall apart, let their people get killed, and then raise up the countless undead, remember he's the god of undeath, and fight all four chaos gods on his own. You see, he has the biggest ego in the mortal realms. He thinks that he can do it. He's a one-man wrecking crew. So at a particularly big climactic battle called the Battle of the Burning Skies, Nagash abandoned them and things went bad. Sigmar, who was leading the defense, lost his weapon, Galmaraz, which is sort of like an extension of his power. The pantheon of gods was shattered to infighting and the forces of good were in absolute disarray. With so many dead and things falling apart in the worst way possible, Sigmar became furious. In fact, he got so furious at Nagash's betrayal, or perceived betrayal, that he just basically walked away from the chaos invasion, marched on Shayish's throne of death, seeking to kill Nagash. He wanted vengeance before anything else. He ignored the enemy at his gate, 
to go kill the traitor in his midst. Now, ultimately, he had to relent. Kind of his cooler head prevailed, and he realized, this is just not going to work. Instead of going to hunt down a rival, I should go back home and kind of secure things. And so he gave up hunting Nagash, went back to Azir, his realm of heavens, and locked every single entrance to it. These entrances are called realm gates, and they're basically just portals that allow you to go from realm to realm. But what this did was it isolated him from the rest of the realms. It basically closed off his borders and left everyone else to their fate. This is important because many factions still resent him for doing that. Now at this point, chaos is rampant. The Pantheon has shattered. Everyone's kind of looking out for themselves instead of working together. And chaos is becoming more and more ascendant across the realms. This time period is called the Age of Chaos. These vast, sprawling empires were all torn down. Progress and hope were lost in equal measure, and things got dark really fast. The good news, if there is any good news for this period, is that Sigmar didn't just abandon the realms. He realized that the way they were trying to conduct war, the way they were trying to push back chaos, it just wasn't going to work in the long game. And so he locked himself in his ear and set to crafting the perfect weapon. This weapon, called the Stormcast Eternals, was meant to be like the ultimate hammer to push back the forces of darkness. The way it works is that um, all across the realms, these heroes are making valiant last stands as the forces of evil destroy everything they know and love. Well, right before their death, Sigmar would pluck up the best and the brightest warriors all across the realm. He would shoot down his bolt of lightning and they would disappear. He'd bring them back to Azir and then turn them into living weapons to fight chaos. He would imbue the power of lightning into each one of them. The main kind of thing about Stormcast Eternals is they don't really truly die. When they're struck down in combat, their souls arc back to Azir to be reforged, to have a new body built around them. Now, I want to make it very clear here, that does not mean there's no consequences to being reforged. See my videos on Stormcast for that. It's actually a really cool process with some dire consequences to it. But this is the weapon that Sigmar was designing to reclaim the realms. Problem is, it took a long time. Nearly 500 years after the Age of Chaos broke out, Sigmar reopened the gates to Azir and thus began what we call the Age of Sigmar after the game's name. This opening of the gates was initiated by a huge campaign called the Realm Gate Wars. You see, earlier I mentioned that Realm Gates allow you to go from one realm to the other. So as you can probably figure out really quickly, these locations are of massive strategic value to be able to go from one place to another. So Sigmar's opening move in the pushing back of chaos and making a good stand was to secure as many vital locations of these realm gates as possible. One, so that his forces can get around very easily and fight the war in a smart way, but also mainly just to deny chaos from having them. And I actually did a big five-part series covering the Realm Gate Wars, very in-depth videos. It's a lot of fun. I really do recommend it. It's actually some of my favorite videos I ever made. I'll leave that link down below, but um, very cool things happen here. And the campaign itself, the Realm Gate War campaign as a whole, was largely successful at pushing back the darkness, at least initially. Many cities were established across the realms. Azir still acts as the home base of good guys, if you will. And when I say cities kind of grew, I mean they are colossal. There's actually one called Hammerhall that it is this immaculate, mind-boggling city. And it was built around a realm gate. So half the city is in one realm and the other half is in a different one. But the two work together as one cohesive government. It's a really cool idea. And from this point, right, when the Realm Gate War campaign series ends, things fast forward a little bit. It does that basically to kind of fill out the world. We kind of skip forward in time to a point where there's a lot more cities, a lot more towns, people are really exploring and living in the realms. And it brings us into the next and current chapter of the Age of Sigmar world, which is the Soul Wars. Now, if you remember, the last time we saw Nagash was when he thought he could take on all four Chaos Gods by himself by kind of breaking apart the Pantheon. He went and hid in Shayish, and Sigmar was hunting him. 
Well, Sigmar never got to him, but somebody else did, a chaos warrior named Archeon the Ever Chosen. And so when things were going really, really bad in the Age of Chaos, Archeon was able to strike down Nagash, who didn't die, he just needed a lot of time to recover. Archeon is a really cool champion. I won't go too much into his lore here because it's not really super relevant to the overarching thing, but he's a really cool guy. Well, upon his recovery, Nagash realized, okay, that was dumb of me. I couldn't take the whole thing, oh, all four Chaos Gods on by myself at that point. I need more power. But he's still arrogant enough to think that this is possible. So he begins scouring his own realm, Shaiish, Realm of Death, for a material called Realmstone. If, if you're not familiar with the term, it's basically concentrated death magic in a solid form. If you're familiar with other kind of fantasy settings, if you've ever seen like a, maybe in D&D &D or another kind of fantasy novel where there's like a magic stone inside of a bracelet that gives the wizard power or something like that, it's basically that. It's just solidified magic. If you imbue it in an object, it becomes magical. Well, Nagash sent hordes of skeletons and zombies and everything like that to go collect Realmstone, and he was going to build a giant black pyramid out of it. This is an arcane device that would ultimately funnel all death magic into him. And kind of the grand goal of the spell was twofold. One, to instantly kill everyone in the mortal realms. And secondly, to give him complete control over their bodies, to be the ultimate power across the mortal realms. And with an entire eight realms worth of bodies and skeletons and zombies and ghosts, he would fight all four chaos gods himself. It's a power play to seize immediate control in a single moment. The details of this ritual were recounted in the book Soul Wars by Josh Reynolds. As Nagash was trying to enact the ritual itself, he realized that a race of rat men called Skaven had infiltrated his sanctuary, gotten into the Black Pyramid, and they were just kind of messing with things. They chiseled away at pieces of it, uh, and basically their presence as chaos forces kind of messed the whole thing up. But Nagash began the ritual assuming that he was still like very confident that he can get this to work. Right? I can make this happen. And again, we discussed what it was supposed to do, but it did not do that thing. Instead of instantly killing and then resurrecting everything under his control, the now kind of defunct ritual sent out a massive shockwave from Shaiish. It's called the Necroquake. It is a narrative-defining event. Every single faction has been changed by the Necroquake, and it did a few things. For starters, it kind of opened a black hole in Shaiish. There is a singular point that all of the realm is kind of being slowly sucked into as it kind of collapses in on itself. Across every other realm, it awoke the spirits of the dead. Ghosts came out of nowhere. Zombies are rising up in just about every corner of the realms. In fact, this is so monumental that it gave birth to an entirely new army that we know as the Night Haunt. And lastly, and probably most importantly, it radically destabilized the way that magic works across the realms. If you've ever heard of the term or seen it played with endless spells, that is what it is. Usually you'd cast a magic, like a fireball or something, and the magic over time would dissipate. Well, now things are so messed up and in flux that those spells just don't dissipate. They just kind of keep going. Now, the downside here is that even though Nagash raised a whole army, right, the Night Haunt, he didn't have direct control over them. And it didn't kill the living as it was intended to do. Now, the last of the novels, chronologically, as I mentioned before, was Soul Wars by Josh Reynolds, and it depicts the Necroquake in great detail. We see its effects across every single realm, and uh, every single battle tome that's come out since these events has had a before and after the Necroquake kind of effect. It is that pivotal of a moment in the history of the realms. And I mentioned a lot of the things it did. What well, we actually learn in the most recent expansion on the Soul Wars campaign series uh, called Forbidden Power, that one of the things it did was it unveiled a whole bunch of secrets that were kind of planted across the realms. Basically, during the Age of Myth, as civilizations were growing and thriving, Sigmar realized that there's a whole bunch of weapons and crazy beasts that we can't kill and all this stuff all across the realms. Realms are a dangerous place. So rather than destroying a bunch of them, he hid them away in secret vaults called storm vaults. And uh, he basically put some technology in there that shrouds them and the Necroquake 
blew away the cloak. And so now what we're currently doing in the Age of Sigmar lore is everyone is just now realizing there are incredible weapons stockpiled for them all across the mortal realms. And so now every faction from destruction, chaos, order, and death are now making mad dashes to get to these vaults in order to get the new kind of arms race going. Again, that's just a side effect of what the Necroquake did, but that's actually what's happening right now. It's this big arms race to get everyone securing the best weapons in the realm. Now I'll go into a lot more detail about Storm Vaults and the way that they were kind of disguised and hidden in a future lore video. But I also want to say that the Necroquake, like I said before, has personal ramifications for each faction. And if you want to know how it affected every single one of them, go watch my lore series on the various armies. If you want to see like all of my playlists, you can head over to my channel, click playlists, click created playlists. And if you're brand new to the game, I'd suggest just starting with an army that interests you and then branch out from there. As I said, I have well over 200 videos of just Age of Sigmar lore goodness. And lastly, I want to emphasize that there is a ton of background and story to this game and all of it is a lot of fun to learn about. I shaved off a whole lot for time's sake in this video, but please do go down to the show notes and explore some of the playlists that I picked out for you. If you know someone who is interested in Age of Sigmar lore or wants to get caught up on the grand narrative here pretty quickly, if you would please share this video with them, it would mean the world to me. I publish several videos a week, many of which are regarding Age of Sigmar lore. So thank you all so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you in my next AOS lore video. Happy Wargaming.